Hello everyone and welcome back to Spirit School. Danielle Serenk here, also known as the Squamish Medium. I am very excited to share an interview with you today with Detective K. Detective K is in law enforcement in California. She is in her 10th year of detective work and she shares a lot about her story as her um, childhood, her interactions with law enforcement at a young age, and her motivations to serving the public in this capacity. I personally have been mentoring Kay in her light working for the past almost four years now. And one thing I notice as a professional psychic medium that's very Googleable is I have always received messages from people who are looking for assistance of some kind when it comes to psychic investigation, whether that is a missing pet or a missing human. Um, even body recovery work has been something that I have been called out to help with. Now, this is not an area of work that I typically am drawn to, but I will, of course, always answer the call to serve however spirit sees best I can help. So there have been a handful of instances that I have helped different families in their time of need. And I always wondered about mediums and psychics being involved in active investigations. Is there a way we can screw it up? Is there a way we can become suspects if we are incredibly accurate? These are the big questions that I wanted to ask somebody who is in law enforcement, but who also has a lens on the lightworking space and has a desire to help not just humanity, but the world of spirit. So this is a longer podcast episode. It definitely comes with its set of trigger warnings. There is mention and note of abuse, domestic violence, Violence, as this is Detective K's area of work and specialty in law enforcement. So just be mindful that this conversation does come up as part of this long interview and you know make sure you have your systems in place to support if something comes up for you and i hope above all else that this interview helps answer some of your burning questions maybe inspires you on psychic investigation if this is an area of work that you are interested in and overall i just hope you enjoy Kay's energy and the conversation we had now you can watch the video of this interview on youtube or you can listen to the audio version on the Spirit School podcast. But if you ever want to attend these conversations live, I usually invite one person who inspires me or who I genuinely have questions for to have a live conversation with me in the Spirit School community, which is completely free. It's off social media. It's slow. There's no algorithms. There's no ads. It's just a very intentional space for people who are spiritually curious to gather and have conversations. So next month, I will be having one of my really good friends, Deb Squazero, on Spirit School coming to have a conversation with me in the community. She is someone who inspires me, who is constantly doing gallery readings is really well known in her community and this woman just inspires me the confidence and the way that she pivoted from her career in teaching to becoming a full-time psychic medium not that far off from retirement so i'm looking forward to sharing her with spirit school next month but for this month i hope you enjoy the conversation between me and detective k Hi, Officer K. How are you? <laughs> well, good evening. Hi there, Danielle. This is very exciting. It is. Your setup looks so good. I'm in the depths of winter up here in Canada. There's no lighting. So uh, your background looks great. You look beautiful. How are you feeling tonight? I am excited. I'm ready to share and just like, I know you're my mentor, but I'm like, wow, I just feel like this is going to be a conversation um, with a friend that's like, a very unique conversation that I'm excited uh, to see how many people are interested in. Definitely. I am so excited and so grateful that you're here. Uh, we'll give a little bit of context as we get going. So you all know as well, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. We have Kitsilino. Hello, Karen. Uh, we got Boise, Kentucky, Wisconsin, San Diego. I love this. I mean, this is what I love about like having an online community. I love seeing where everyone kind of connects in from. So welcome to the live. I have on my envelope because I was like cooking yesterday and all these thoughts are coming in while I'm cooking and I'm marking everything down 
down. I'm like, these are the questions I have for you. If I had somebody here who is on the other side of like psychic investigations, in fact, you're, you're kind of on both sides, which I want to talk about. <laughs> like, what would I ask you? So I have a list of questions I'm going to work through friends, but you're welcome to ask some questions as well. Near the end, we will be able to answer some. So uh, keep those with you and we'll do kind of like a hashtag question at the end for Kay here. But let's start by just saying welcome to Spirit School. This is your first time live in the community on the podcast, but you're no stranger to Spirit School. Um, so why don't we just start with you introducing yourself and what you do and all like how you like to be known in the world. Sounds good. Let's do it. Uh, my name is Kay Avila and um, I didn't grow up like being in touch with spirit. Um, I grew up very shy. I wore my emotions on my sleeve and I didn't realize that that and my career choice of law enforcement a little over 10 years would build these walls that would protect me, but also make it more difficult for spirit to communicate with me. So I like to describe myself as um, a medium. I am Reiki master attuned. So I do um, intuitive Reiki sessions where loved ones pop in with messages while we're sending healing energy. Um, I'm a yoga teacher. I am a sound bath certified. I have my first one this year on Saturday. And I'm a mother, I'm a new wife. I've never had that title before. So that's very exciting. I am officially wifed up and it feels great to have like a best friend and lover for the rest of my life. And I've been a part of your community for like two and a half years now. And I've really just grown and developed there. Oh, and I'm a law enforcement officer and I am an interpersonal violence, um, interpersonal violence, detective or investigator um and i'm very very passionate about it but it definitely found me it's not mm -hmm. something that i thought i was going to um sign up for on my own i had to get nudges from spirit pushes actually yeah i want to know so much more about that because i mean you know thank you for that beautiful intro i love having someone here even in spirit school over the years i've been able to attract people throughout law enforcement um i've worked with prison guards and judges and different doctors and i'm always so drawn how open people in the system seem to be and we don't have that vision of the system from this lens right so it always comforts me to know people like you who are in those branches are doing the work and are influencing those branches of our um, government and and systems and society so i'm really happy about that but i want to know what drew you to police work what drew you to detective work and is it something that like like fills you up with your favorite part of it. I have so many questions about this coming. Oh. But yeah, but that's where I'll start. <laughs> Perfect. Those are great questions. Bring them on, Danielle. So I definitely, um, you know, like a lot of us, I grew up very poor. My parents worked very, very hard, though. Um, they they worked really hard to give us what we had. Um, and you know, a lot of my family within my immediate family was in and out of jail. And so I actually did not have um, the best perception of law enforcement. They were, as a little girl, taking my loved ones away and quite honestly, not being very respectful about it. And instead of like bitching and complaining about it, which I did all through high school. And if you would have asked me in high school, if I would ever be a cop, I'd be like, oh, hell no, there is no way I would ever be a cop. And here I am, but I wanted to make a difference. I have those personal experiences with my loved ones in and out of jail, being arrested, dealing with probation, and I wanted to make a difference and treat people with compassion and respect. They're all human. We all make mistakes. I do believe 99.9 .9 of us want to do good. And the more I continue on this healing journey, the more I realize that people are just reacting from a place of wounds that haven't been healed, hurt people, hurt people. And, you know, sometimes that even gets in my mind when I'm interviewing suspects. So it really infiltrates 
everywhere and it's very interesting and I'm constantly learning. Mm. So I, um, I had my son, I got pregnant at 21 and I, you know, you want to do better and you want a better place for your children. And um, I became a mother and I realized that I wanted to go into law enforcement, but I wanted to make sure. And I think that's my Virgo moon. I went on over like 25 ride alongs with different places. <laughs> you can't like intern to be a law enforcement officer, but you can go on ride alongs with law enforcement officers. And I went everywhere throughout the state. <laughs> and the first one that I went on, oh, it was so good. We, the first, um, the first ride along that I went on, the very first call we went to was um, a mother that wanted to report their son missing and he had gotten into gangs and the officer sat down at the table with her and was really empathetic and tried his hardest to find the location. They filled out the missing person form and he just treated them with so much respect and that really stuck with me because I am a feeler, I am a cancer. And so I could feel the compassion and the energy that he was bringing into their home and the respect he was bringing in there. And I, I was the one that went in with preconceived notions about this white male. I assumed he was gonna act a specific way and I was pleasantly surprised. And I was the one that was incorrect in my preconceived notions. And the very last call we went on ended up turning into like um, a very short vehicle pursuit. And then I had to stay in the car, but he ran out, but I could, he ran out in foot pursuit, these two male subjects, but I could hear his radio traffic in the, the vehicle of the unit. And I could hear the radio traffic in the unit and he like jumped over a fence and another fence and then he had them at taser point and i'm like you can get paid to do this <laughs> <laughs> and i was like whoa and they put they found one of the men and put him in the back seat they didn't tell me not to talk to him and i'm yeah. a chatty kathy and so i'm like asking him like they're like, are you a cop? I'm like, no, I'm on a ride along. Um, I'm like, I'm like, F the police. <laughs> um, I asked him how old he was when he got jumped in, what his name was, what they call him. Why is he running from the police? And he's very honest with me. Um, it was like the best night of my life. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I love you so much. And so went on more ride alongs and I um, put myself through the academy when, when, um, agencies were not hiring they didn't have the money i think they were still recovering from like the 2008 um um what are the words i'm looking for market, market. thank you yeah. yeah yes and um so i self-sponsored i sold a lot of things at yard sales i actually used to do scholarship pageants so i sold a lot of my dresses as well and that's what paid for me to go through the academy and mm -hmm. It was really hard with a one and a half year old. I stopped nursing the week before. I did not realize I was still gonna be lactating during the academy. I did not realize I needed to drink way more water. And then you have to be like, sir, yes, sir. Can I use the restroom? And I was using the restroom all of the time. <laughs> and it was a hot mess the first, I was a hot mess, um, but it, and embarrassingly, I got like the worst award at the end of the academy, which is the most improved. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but it was it was a great experience. I started working for a smaller um, agency that only had eleven officers. I was the only female, and I learned a lot there. But it was also um, a big field worker city, so I. I had to really brush up on my Spanish. People were afraid of the police. I remember I wanted to like pass out stickers to the kids and they ran away from me. And so a lot of community oriented policing needed to go into that community because I knew where they were coming from. I could understand I had been in their shoes, but also I was the only female. So I was assigned 
all the child sex crimes and the interpersonal violence crimes, the intimate partner crimes, not all of them, but I, I got a lot of them. Yeah. And then I, um, transferred to a different department as a single mom, I needed to transfer to, to a department that paid more and it, it tripled my pay by transferring to this department with a completely different socioeconomic status and completely different races that were there. Um, it was definitely not as colorful there, but I had to do what I had to do. And after working there for a few years, this detective position opened up and it was a general detective position. And I had been on nights. And so the last thing that I was, was trauma informed and wanting to work with domestic violence and dating violence survivors. And I put in a, put a memorandum of interest. I interviewed and got this general detective position. I was ready to like, investigate robberies. I was ready for stabbings. I was ready. I was like, this is going to be fun. And my lieutenant in charge of the detectives bureau told me as soon as I got it, you're going to be investigating sex crimes. And I was like, sir, with all due respect, this was a general detective position. And then my Virgo moon, I like pulled up the email that showed the <laughs> announcement. I was like, see, it says general. Uh, detective position here. Yes. And <laughs> it was a hard no. It's like, no, you're going to be investigating sex crimes. And so you don't, it's still a paramilitary style uh, department. Uh, all law enforcement is. So mm -hmm. I was not going to question him um, about that. That was pushing it the first time. And I was so bummed. Um, I was like, what is, what is my lesson here? Like, this isn't what I want to do. And I went to the first training for, um, just the, the basic training for sex crimes. And I realized there, and it broke my heart that I had been interviewing survivors like suspects. Cause that's all I had known that I had done so many things wrong. And that first night of the training, I usually you go out and you go drinking with all the other cops. I was in my room, like crying, feeling so bad, wishing I could go back. Uh, I had learned so much about how trauma is stored in the brain. Um, you know, you have the different parts of the brain and you have the amygdala and you have the hippocampus and the hippocampus job is to store memories. But when trauma and stress are, um, are in, invited, I don't want to say invited, but when trauma and stress come into the situation, it pumps cortisol and it, it stops making those memories. And so I was like, wow, there's, there's science behind why they can't remember. They're not lying to me. And it was a really, it's really deep feelings that I had to go in there. And I wanted to do the best that I can do. And I really, really fell in love with this type of work. Um, it's given me so much more than, than what I can give. So it found me um, very bluntly. And I only knew during my spiritual awakening the last two and a half years that that was all intentional and that is my path. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that context to this and the history of it. Because I was going to ask, like, when did the intuitive stuff start coming in? How did that start coming in? And did that give you kind of like an identity crisis of some kind? Uh, did it feel like two separate worlds? Can you blend them together in any way? Like, what does this look like for a medium who's also a detective? Mm. Yes. Oh, man. So in the beginning, I think it was like, January 1st of 2021, I'd gone to a yoga class and I'm like, I don't like yoga. And I was outside for the new year. And I remember when we were laying down during Shavasana, looking up at the tree, it was a beautiful oak tree and just noticing all of the branches. They were so vibrant, like the colors were so deep, like the details on the tree I'd never noticed before. I was hearing birds when I don't know the last time I had heard birds. And I just had this 
trust that there is something more. And so I was eager, I, like a couple nights later, I was in bed and uh, my partner at the time um, was a paraplegic. So he was in a wheelchair, so he cannot make footsteps. Okay. And so that night I was in bed and I heard footsteps. It woke me up and I woke up and rewind. I turned my white noise machine off because I'm like, okay, if something's going to happen, I want to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> and spirit heard me because um, we didn't have the kids and he can't make footsteps. And so I heard footsteps and I woke up and I'm like, okay, what am I supposed to do here? So in my mind, I'm like, hello there. And I was like, I'm not afraid. You can come here. And then I heard something right next to my bed. I got up, I screamed, and I ran into my partner's bedroom. Uh, and I, it went for like four or five months of me being brave and inviting and then me getting scared because I grew up Catholic. And I grew up that these things were negative energies or could be related to the devil, which I now know is the furthest thing from the truth. And that's when spirit led me to your podcast. And that's when um, I knew I had to go to Sedona. I started Googling on my phone, going to Sedona. I didn't tell anyone. And then that night, and I know this makes sense, doesn't make sense. My partner had like different equipment and machines and I couldn't really sleep. Um, and I wake up very early for work. So we actually slept in different rooms. So I was in bed that night um, looking up trips to Sedona. And this is like when no one is going on airplanes. It's the middle of COVID. And I was supposed to basically be on call because there was protests about the election. And I'm like, well, I'll just look it up and maybe I'll go after. That night was the first and only time I had heard a voice out of my head and it said, go now. And it was a male's voice and it woke me up and I knew it was talking about Sedona. And I'm like, oh, I must have just dreamed that. Of course, you know, our, our ego, I must have just dreamed that. And I closed my eyes, but I was awake and I heard it again as clear as day. And I was like, I must go and I'm not going to get called in. There's no way they're going to call me in. If spirit wants me to go, I'm going to go. And I was so excited to go. I'm like, I'm going to go learn how to talk to dead people. This is going to be great. It's, it's like three days, you know, awesome. <laughs> Just one sec. That is, I get it. I get it. <laughs> it's nighttime here. I don't think she knows what we're doing here right now. No, that's okay. I have a goat with a sore throat that you might hear any minute right now. And it sounds like someone's getting murdered. So there's just my forewarning for that trigger warning for that. And so I went to Sedona and little did I know that everything that I had scheduled for me was just a bunch of healing. I had, I don't think I've ever been so overwhelmed and crying and laughing and so much healing. And I had like my first reading and it was amazing. It was so healing. And I never um, got called into work. And I knew I wasn't going to get called into work. And I forgot the rest of your question. No, I was wondering <laughs> when the spirituality came in and this trip to oh, Sedona yes. really woke you up. And I'm curious to know what happens when you get back. <laughs> and someone's going to come close the door here in a second, everyone. <laughs> so No, that's okay. <laughs> And so, um, yeah, I found your podcast and you had the initiation. Um, and so that, that, I think that was in April of 2021. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and I adore you, Danielle, but like in, in it, you did not say we were going to have two practice readings until <laughs> you sign up. And then once you, once I signed up and it said that, I was like, oh, jaw dropped. I'm going to have two practice readings every week. I was like, I didn't sign up for this. I was like, I can't do this. This is like a few years down the road before I can do this. <laughs> and it was, it was perfect. I had, um, 
Allie, who it was her first time as well, and she was in a different country, and I was in my car, and she she did it as well, and she was the perfect um, person. And it's like, wow, I can do this. And I think spirit, you know, gives us a really good first reading. So it's like, see, you can do this. And then it's like a constant yeah. work and struggle bus after that for a little bit. <laughs> and so yeah, I found you and I've been working on that. And I found Reiki, which I think helped me as well. I delve into my yoga practice um, and mixing that with work. That was very interesting because I think I was so open. I didn't have any boundaries with spirit. And I know some people may or may not believe in lower density, heavier energies, um, but I work with them. They, they are either the attachments to the suspects that do these violent, horrible things or what I don't know exactly, but um, I wasn't protecting myself well. I would... And I don't want to scare anyone. So if you get scared, maybe stop listening and come back in a couple minutes. But I remember, for example, like hearing um, in my office, which I shared with my partner, my coworker partner, like little breeze, like little quick breezes. Um, and I was like, what is going on here? I also was feeling tired. I wasn't seeing colors very bright. I was having nightmares about these things happening to my loved ones where I couldn't move and I couldn't yell and I, I couldn't do anything but watch. And um, I, I saw a healer, I saw a Reiki healer who was also in your group and she, I didn't tell her anything, but she did Reiki on me. And she's like, the weirdest thing was there were all these little twisters trying to get into your aura. And she's like, yeah, it was like windy when I was working on you. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, I've been feel, I've been mm. hearing these little winds a few times the last couple of weeks, but my partner doesn't hear them. And there were a few more incidents like that. It was different things with different suspects. Anyone's gut, anyone's aura would contract and try and move away from this type of work, but I had to write warrants and read through the messages that these suspects sends to their grandma, also to the victims, to their mother, also to other victims, and I have to be in their energy for work. As much as my energy is, might be adverse to it, I had to be in it. And I think sitting in it for so long, I was starting to um, get drained by it. And so one thing that really helped was um, cleansing, obviously my home, but cleansing my office space. I'm sitting in there for 10, 12 hours. And so I do, I do use um, black salt when I light in an incense. I light it with a good, intention and then I collect the ash from the incense and I mix it with salt. So I make my own black salt that I know comes from intentions of love and light when I light the um, incense. And I will put the black salt at the doorway and at the window. Obviously first I will cleanse the space. Um, I have plants in there now. I have a little waterfall to keep the energy moving. It's got birds on it, but I have plants. I have a waterfall. I have black tourmaline in all the corners. I, I have like everything. I have the picture that we drew at the, um, at retreat. the spirit school retreat when we were in the Akashic records and that is on my wall. Mm -hmm. So it's much better now. Yeah. And with that was just my confidence. I, I was calling on Archangel Michael all of the time, which is great. I know you've taught us that he can be many places all at once, but I also think that was um, perpetuating how much I was calling on him, giving mm -hmm. power to um, whatever it was. And I'm at the point now where I rarely call on him because I'm confident in how much light I have and mm. I feel untouchable now, but it's, it took me like two and a half years to get to where I'm at. Um, but it was quite 
quite a journey and, you know, a lot of practice and I didn't quite know where to go to help, but I'm so grateful for your community that had people that always had ideas and I tried them all and had that space that I can confide in when I needed help. Yeah, definitely. So I'm watching the chat as we're talking and I even wrote down black salt and a couple of people are like, ooh, black salt. And then you described what it was, which I absolutely love the sacred practices. And that was a conversation we were having in the collective yesterday. I asked, what do you do to cleanse your energy? Like, what do you do? And I added salt as a, because I love salt baths. I don't know how I'd like a black salt bath cleaning that after, but it sounds yeah. absolutely divine. And like how much intention you put into your practices. Cause that's where I was going next. Like, how do you stay balanced? Um, you know, I've only been involved in a handful of different cases, always with the family and, you know, maybe it is all the practice you get in your police work, but um, how do you stay emotionally well? Because you're seeing some of like the worst of society and you're a light worker and this other side, you're leading yoga classes and doing bomb ass mediumship sessions, by the way. <laughs> I got it. I got a connection from Kay yesterday and it was like blew my mind. I was literally slamming my hands on the table. I'm like, get out. So like, how do you like, uh, you know, stay emotionally well? How do you see the beauty in the world when you've seen what it's doled out in the shadow? Oh boy. Well, I'm just going to talk and let spirit guide me through this one because that's a heavy one. It definitely goes in waves. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I'm an emotional being. I'm sure there's a ton of highly sensitive people here. And so I talked about the suspect side of it, but the survivor side of it, some of these, um, like, I think it's very sacred. I like to think of introducing myself before I interview these survivors with my energy first and then my language and then empowering them and being cognizant of subconscious power dynamics. I'm, I'm never going to be sitting by the only door. Um, I will always choose another spot so that they can sit by the door. If they sit down, I'm sitting down. If they're sitting down on the ground, I'm sitting down on the ground. I'm never going to be taller than them I'm very careful with my language. Um, I like to use empowering language, give them choices and remind them of their choices because unfortunately, I am going to re-trigger them. We can't, I, I can try to minimize how much I do it, but if we're gonna be talking about this incident that they were victimized in, um, and they don't want to talk about it, but they do want a report. And I ask a lot of questions. I have to be very trauma informed. And part of a trauma informed interview is minimizing the amount of times that you're going to interview them, which means that I am going to be asking them a lot of questions and very detailed questions. But I also tell them like, hey, we're approaching a question that might be a little deep. Um, I'm going to explain to you why I need this question and how it's going to be helpful for your case. Um, I also tell them if they need time with their advocate, I, I remind them that they can take a break and I'm more than happy to step out. Um, because these things are these things are heavy and I think if it is very sacred and it's an honor that they're sharing these things with me that they may never repeat to anyone else and they have maybe not told anyone else. And the first person that a survivor discloses information to is so pivotal in, in how they may share this information with someone else or if they go to law enforcement, if they feel supported or not. And as dark as this is, it's it's an honor to have someone trust me and to allow me to make this safe space for them. Um, and so since I try not to get attached, I'm I made an oath to be fair and unbiased for all. Um, having an advocate, if I were to give anyone any advice, if I could give them one piece of advice, it's to get an advocate because um, the advocate can give them their resources and their options. And um, even if I'm not involved, they feel empowered 
and they have someone that they can trust. And in an interview, an advocate can say things like, you are doing so good, you're so brave, I'm so proud of you, and I cannot say those things. My interview is evidence, and if I were to say things like that, that would look very biased. If I'm not saying those same things in a suspect interview, that mm -hmm. is not very fair and impartial of me. Um, but I try to say those things with my energy, with the tone of my voice, with my body language, with my nonverbal cues. Um, and it's so hard not to take those things home. It's so hard not to think, I wish there was more I could do. I really like how proactive the state of California is, but the state of California is also so liberal with um, not wanting to impede on suspects' rights. That unfortunately, that that puts more mud in cleanup for survivors to do. Like for example, an emergency protective order in California is only good for five to seven days. So after a traumatic event, they have to go to the court and read through this legal jargon and try to get a temporary restraining order and. Um, other states like Texas are around, like you can keep extending it up to 91 days um, when a violent incident has occurred. Mm. And there's just things that, you know, upset me that if I were in Sacramento, I would love to change. Um, mm. But you really feel for them and you wish there was more that you can do. I think what helps me but also hurts me is seeing them as my daughters or as my sons. Um, and so I've had to create healthy boundaries around that. And what that is, is I allow myself to feel it, but then I will just cleanse it. Um, I will just either cleanse it, cleanse it with breath, mm -hmm. cleanse it with sage that I've picked and, and asked for permission when I picked from the plant. Um, I believe all things have auras and, or I will use a bell. Um, but if I just have to quickly visualize while I'm walking away, I will just visualize cleansing that, like I will feel it, um, and I will release it with love because mm -hmm. I can't carry all of that. I tried and I was, I was literally like crying on my way home almost every day for a little bit. Yeah. So I, it's okay for me to feel it, but I have to release it because it is not mine. It's not my journey and I'm just doing the best that I can do. And that is the best that I can do. And that is always enough. Yeah. Beautiful Kay. And I absolutely agree with that I think anyone who reads your energy, anyone who's in your energy can feel your intention and your heart centeredness in this work. And, you know, I'm a Virgo sun, you're a Virgo moon. I mean, the depths of service we want to, it's like, give us the biggest cases, give us like, you know, the heart that needs the most healing. Like that's just like very much part of our placements as well. And there was a quite a few amazing tips that I hope people heard through what you just shared. I mean, you answered half my questions just from what you just <laughs> shared, which I absolutely love. Um, you know, one of the things that stands out for me, I want people to really take in is when you talked about you know, when I'm in this situation and sensitive topics, because if you're a psychic medium, drop me an emoji if you've ever been reached out to by a family, um, whether it's a missing pet, whether it's like an unsolved something or other, if you've ever been reached out, because people do, families will look up psychic mediums and reach out to them. And it is quite a skill set to talk to other people in very sensitive spaces in their lives. And it adds a whole nother layer to uh, sitting with someone. And so what you shared was like, when you're in these sensitive sensitive containers with people. It's like I, I lead with my energy first and then my language. And I can't remember the third thing you said, but what were those three steps? It was I lead with my energy and then my language. Do you remember? So maybe I just have to say it. Let me see. So <laughs> yeah, we can rewind too. I think I just also went into subconscious power dynamics as well. Right. So yes, yeah. language, subconscious power dynamics, always providing options. You can never provide someone that had something so delicate taken from them. You can never give them enough options unless it's overwhelming, but like options just about if they want water, if they want breaks, you know, like, um, I can't even 
how's the temperature? Just in empowering them with little things first, asking them easier questions in the beginning, like their name, what do they do for fun, building rapport, explaining what it's going to look like because the unknown is so scary. Um, and knowing that any decision that they make, it to, today I do need a decision because I have to document it. These are your options. However, if tomorrow you change your mind, I just need it in writing. Like it's not permanent. They're not making a permanent decision, which removes some of that pressure they're already putting on themselves. It's just options, 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 and informing them. I am a detective that tends to give more information to the survivors. This happened to them. This is their case. And if it's not going to hurt the case, I am going to give the survivor as much information about the case that I think will help them in their healing journey, make the most informed choice for themselves and their body that they can make. Yeah. And I will, I will argue that with anyone that tries to tell me, oh, you shouldn't do that. Well, Okay, yeah. let's let's fight. Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> let's fight. <laughs> I love that. Okay, yeah. so many gems in there. I mean, even just the last twenty minutes are worth rewinding, re-listening. Um, there's so many communication techniques that you share. Um, it's just so we're so lucky to have you here right now. Now, when it comes to yeah. your detective work as a psychic. Well, there's a couple of things. Okay. I want to ask you two things. Like one is like, what are some of the signs that, you know, maybe you've taken on too much, you're caring too much. Um, you, your boundaries may be moving, right? Cause like sometimes boundaries are only temporary and then we have to kind of shift them as we move along. Like, what are some of those signs? Like I, I'm capped out, I'm too much. And then the other thing is like, how much has psychic and mediumship development supported you in your detective work? And has, has that come up? Good, good questions. So I think what I was explaining earlier, when I'm feeling like I'm getting too much, I will start to get tired. I, um, I will have difficulty sleeping. Um, I will, the colors of things don't seem as bright. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and if I still don't listen to myself and I'm pushing through it and I'm not going to a healer, um, then I spirit will just start sending me nightmares, which means it's like infiltrated my subconscious and it's like, nope. And then once I have my first nightmare, I'm usually like making an appointment with someone for Reiki and making an appointment for acupuncture and I'm going to yoga. I'm like, okay, okay. I get it now. It's like, yeah. cause you want to keep going and you want to just keep going. And the introduction to like, I want to say really, let's see what, what year are we in? Oh my gosh. I don't know. So maybe 2024. <laughs> 2024. I think maybe like a year and a half ago, I was um, not only the a sex crimes detective, I was the lead detective. And it, it's a smaller agency. And I went to homicide school. It's a two week school. And this was when I was like, this was basically at a point where I was like trying to feel spirit because, you know, before my mediumship readings, I did everything that you like kind of joke about. I'd put a crystal in my bra. I'd meditate for a half hour before I'd like call in like all my loved ones and guides to really help me connect and feel things. And I'd maybe get a few things and then I'd be silent for like a minute. And I'm like, come on, come on, come on. Like, please send me a blunt blunt AF message, you know, like something. And so I was really trying. So when I was really trying was when I um, was sent to homicide school. And when I went to homicide school, they were doing a case debrief about this homicide that occurred in he part of the class he like recorded all of these recordings of voice messages from psychics and he, the person leading this class was making fun of it. They're like, yeah, we had the newest person in detectives call him back. We didn't tell him it was a psychic and we were all making fun of him. And I took that so personally, but I wasn't at a place where I was confident enough in my skills to be like, F you, I'm going to like pick up on your grandma. Like this is real, but I know now I don't have to prove myself to anyone. But I took it personally and I'm like, whoa, this is really not accepted 
in law enforcement. I have seen it like in the UK, you know, that like they use um, psychic detectives and then you shared someone with me that I just recently learned about. And so what he started explaining in this case debrief, I, I started picking up on things about this male and what they looked like. And then when they showed us the the pictures of this the crime scene, I was like, whoa, that's who I like saw in my mind. And I can't remember now, but I was like, oh, it was he had this habit of either like chewing gum or like picking his nail or something. I can't think of what it was. And I could feel it. I'm like, this isn't what I usually do. This must be him. I'm like, he must be here. And like I said, I was at the point where I was like trying to connect with people. And I was like, wow, like he's here with someone. Who's he here with? What they didn't tell us at the end of the class was that was that his mother was in the class and she was going to talk about how compassionate these officers were and and they did a really good job being emotionally available, updating her, being there every step of the way so that she didn't feel alone, providing resources. And she did a great job telling them, but I was so scared to tell her and I didn't. So like I didn't mean to like build this all up and say I was going to tell her what I felt and I gave her a reading. I didn't. And I, mm -hmm. I wasn't at a point where I was going to do that, but I was like, wow, I can feel, I can feel this. And so we had, I guess a homicide investigation. It was a suspicious death in, at our agency. And that's when I was lead detective. And so we got called in. The perimeter was already there. So like the caution tape you see on TV is a real thing. There's like two caution tapes. One is for everyone to stay out. And then the other one is for the media to, to come in. And then the other one is for everyone to stay out except for law enforcement. And they have to log which officers are coming within that very circle perimeter and, and out of it. So before I stepped into that, I'm like, I'm going to just try this and like see what happens. I had not gotten briefed on the case at all. I knew, I knew the race and the age and the gender of the person, and that was it. And so I was a little shy, and I went to a part of the um, perimeter where no one could really see me, and it was by some sycamore trees. And I grounded and I took a few breaths and I, in my mind, clairaudiently, which I'm still working on clairaudience, but that was, must've been the first clairaudient. I started hearing chattering on the right side of my brain and I started hearing chattering on the left. And then it just became overwhelming and it had, was saying negative things in my mind. And I immediately knew that she lived with schizophrenia and mm -hmm. I was like, oh my goodness. And I'm like, I'm like, I think I'm really feeling this. I didn't make this up. And the very first thing is one of my partners and another detective came up and he's like, oh, well, I found some prescriptions in the vehicle. It was like the very next thing that happened is he walked up to me and they were medications for that. And so it was validated really quickly from spirit, but it really helped us change the course of the investigation um, and to, you know, you know, jump on getting surveillance much surveillance much faster than we would have. And it just gave us a little bit more information and never shared that with anyone. And obviously we found that out, you know, like at the same time. And I was like, wow, I can use this. So that was like a big eye opener for me. I'm still working on it, obviously, but what I will do is I have a just a small example of a case that was really I did not want to give up on it. It was breaking my heart. It's probably a case that has caused like the most amount of tears that I had had. And I had to close it and I was like, oh my gosh, I really don't want to close this case. There's just no more leads. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I didn't want to do it. And so I asked some of my loved ones, my loved ones that are on the other side, it's like, I really don't want to close this case. Please, if there's any evidence out there, please let me find it. I'm going to give it a week. And I was very intentional with it. 
I knew I was taught, I grounded and I asked them for that help. I ended up like, I don't know what I did. I had a meeting or something and I wasn't paying attention to my work phone. Well, about 45 minutes after I requested help from my loved ones, the mother of the survivor literally sent me a written statement from another witness that I didn't even know was a witness. It didn't help me file the case, but it did help it keep it open a little longer and help me follow more leads from that. And I was like, wow, thank you. I was so grateful. And I was like, I could have been doing this the whole time. <laughs> you know, all you have to do is ask. Like, that's what I'm always surprised oh, about. <laughs> I know. Make me like, cry. I know you're always telling us that. And it I know. Really took me forever to finally do that. It was like, wow, that was so easy. 45 minutes. Like, I, this case had been cold for months. Like, like, no one was getting back to me. There was no new evidence. It had, like, months. Yeah. And I just felt so grateful for the spirit world. They want to help. Mm. And when you are more specific in what you're asking for, they will provide you, they hear you and they will provide that to you. Yeah. Yeah. So those are like my little examples and I haven't had, you know, any more recent examples. I'm still learning. So if, if anyone is listening and they have tips for me for, for this, I am, I am open and willing to try them, but yeah, that's where I'm at. That's where my life is. That's what fills me up. Yeah, that's beautiful. And you made me really emotional as you're asking that because you can just feel the sincerity and the honesty in it all, to be honest with you. Okay. And it just really does melt my heart. And, you know, you always seem to have that effect on people. So if you need validation that you definitely lead with your energy, I was actually looking at your old post earlier about that, about like, how do you feel in my energy? I'm like, I don't know anyone who wouldn't say that they feel expanded or softened or, you know, comfortable and safe in your energy. And so I'm so glad you're doing this. So I just have a couple questions specific to, you know, when I kind of thought about this topic and I reached out to you because in the collective, it's our psychic AF month and we're going to be looking at doing a practice tomorrow on a case. I'm going to be bringing in my mom, who's like a trim, true crime, like she knows all yeah. true crime. It's, like, it's kind of wild. I don't know anything about true crime, to be honest with you, but she's going to come in and do a practice case. But I wanted to provide a resource for the spirit school listeners, because I personally have been called into a handful of um, suspicious passings, which was my first case that took me two years to work with the family on. And it was very nerve wracking for me. And it wasn't an area I thought I wanted to go. I'll give some more specifics in the collective tomorrow on how I kind of presented that. So you can kind of like practice that technique. But I personally have never worked with law enforcement. And every time somebody reaches out to me, I'm so resistant to it because I'm like, I feel like you could screw this up. Like, I don't want to send people on the wrong like path. And, you know, you really kind of like question, like if you're meant to be doing that. And then I was also worried about, you know, caring more because I'm always carrying a lot. Like, and I'm like, can I carry more? I don't know if I can carry more right now, but what I wanted to provide was a bit of a resource, which you already talked about, like the communicating with victims and victims, families, a lot of great tips in there. And I'm wondering if you have like, like best practices, if a psychic gets reached out to, because I'm sure that there are some here again, drop me an emoji or something. If you have personally been reached out to, because I have since day one. So I would be dead surprised if other people have not been reached out to, but is there like a best practice or a do's and a don'ts for psychics reaching out to law enforcement? Like you say, somebody obviously left a voicemail and a group decided to kind of poke fun a little bit. And, you know, I don't think as a psychic, I get offended by that. <laughs> I'm just like, whatever. I think Jen said here, so many cops are skeptic AF, but they're some of the most <laughs> intuitive people I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like so true. So are there any kind of like best practices? Like don't do this, please do this. And then I'm going to go to the questions in the chat. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I've actually never been asked, believe it or not. So I think that's really ironic, but you know, I, I completely agree with Jen. Like we have a type personalities in law enforcement and you have a lot of people, a lot of people who signed up because they want to do good, but then there's also a mixture of people in there who are unhealed themselves. And, you know, 
in are not necessarily embracing change. And if, if they were to be open to a psychic, they are looking like cops are fact finders. So they are looking for facts and evidence and like what percentage of accuracy. And so I think if you were to present this or plate it to a law enforcement agency, having what percentage of accuracy, how detailed you are, how how close within how many feet did you um, lead someone to a specific item. I definitely want to work on my mediumship more. I'm in your mastermind course, but I also think I'm being guided to practice on remote viewing. You know, you have the Stargate and all of that. And I, I feel like that's going to help me with my work as well. But if you are interested in working with law enforcement, the number one thing from my mistake is you cannot unsee what you see and even if you don't see it and you hear it from someone your brain puts a picture and uh, its own little movie to that and you can't ever erase that mm -hmm. and so just let that sit for a little bit and if you have the capacity to do that or it's worth it to you to help or you feel like that's your calling then i say spirit will guide people your way mm -hmm. and it is going to happen but for people who are hesitant maybe like law enforcement officers having your percentage of accuracy how many like feet close were you to a certain item or piece of evidence and just being confident af which we're all working on our throat chakra and solar plexus but it really you know like I trust spirit 100% and I'm working on trusting myself that much as well. Very healing class yesterday and mastermind for me. But mm -hmm. I know that people are further along in their healing journeys than I am. And if you're further along in your healing journey and this is calling for you, then there's a reason why it's calling for you. And I think you should listen to it because everyone needs help and everyone needs healing and spirit will find a way for you to help people in that way because there's a lot of people that need healing and closure so that yeah. they can move on yeah i i love that and i really appreciate you giving that disclaimer because that's exactly what happened to me which i wasn't going to talk about until tomorrow but you know, when I got reached out for the first time, <laughs> my dad, bless him. He's so cute. He's, he comes home sometimes. He's like, call this person. I said that you would give them a reading. <laughs> like, this is kind of like, <laughs> cause he's a dog walker, right? So he goes around town, call this person. I said that they would give you a reading. So most of my readings are free. Thanks to my dad. No. <laughs> so I, that's how I got hooked up with one of these families. And, you know, so I, I kind of helped with this family and, you know, it was really nerve wracking and it was like a really slow process, like a really slow process that again was rooted in evidence. And that was to build my confidence and make sure that I was really connected. But right after that, I started thinking like, well, it's coming to me, like maybe it's a thing. And we have, you know, Leilani and Justin here who are saying like, yeah, they get asked often as well. And that doesn't surprise us about the three of us, hundred yeah. percent. But what happened was I ended up getting put onto this show in New Zealand about, you know, how psychics help crimes being solved. And it just so happened to be a very graphic show. And it really started giving me intrusive thoughts. So mm -hmm. at that time, I was actually being mentored by a medium who probably doesn't want me to share their name because they're booked and busy. They can't take more cases like they had to leave social media because of it. And so I'm not going to really drop her name here, but I had to call her and just say, you know, I don't think I could do this. I don't think with my kids being so young, I'm ready to have that kind of come in because I got that experience, not even through the case, but through even the TV show. But I will say that about a year later, it started kind of coming back in and it really did help me start my healing journey around my intrusive thoughts. I had to start re researching them and finding the root of them and finding ways of managing it. And so I definitely feel a lot more prepared now than I ever was before. Even at this retreat I was at with Caroline May, somebody's like, look at this picture. Do you pick up anything? And I was like, no, I don't like doing that. But sure enough, the next day in class, I'm drawing a map and I gave it to them. It was like 100% accurate. And I was like, okay. And so, yes. you know. It just kind of like, it just kind of like happens, you know what I mean? So yeah, but the intrusive thoughts is like something that people really have to consider this for themselves. Absolutely. And taking care of yourself. I have a therapist on dial. I've been working with her for years, you know, all that fun stuff. Okay. Exactly. Let me, 
let me go to the group questions here because we're already okay. an hour in. And this was so interesting, Kay. Like I learned a lot from this and oh. I know so many people are going to get so much out of this conversation. So, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me and, and having me experience this. Yeah, no, I'm excited for you. I mean, this is a year to be seen and seeing you are. I mean, I, I told Kay yesterday, I was like, this is probably going to go on the podcast too, you know? And so that's very exciting. So Leilani asks, Kay, do you have a lot? Okay. Do you have, a, do you have spirit ever come to you whose family is searching for their loved ones? What do you do if you ever get a message from spirit who's looking to give their family closure? I, I have not had that. Yeah. So I don't think I have anything to add to that, but if I was getting something in my dreams, I probably would not give it to them. If it was a current investigation, I would not give it to them. I would probably wait until the investigation was complete. And then if the district attorney's office filed the case and then, you know, three, four years later, the trial happens, and then I would probably give it to them. It's very difficult because you, you want to, but you know, there's these, there's these like people called defense attorneys and when they're pulling strings, they're going to pull at your character. And so this is why my name on here is my public name it's not my real name and it's just because i would never want a defense attorney to muddy up the waters of one of my survivors cases because they're trying to poke holes at uh, my character and what i do on my time off and so i would be very careful to for me as a law enforcement officer as a detective to provide that information to them until after but if someone was not a law enforcement officer I think like a trauma informed way as always is to just to just ask and provide information. Hey, this is what I'm do. I'm a medium. I received information from what I think is your loved one. Are you at a space or have the capacity where you would want to receive information? Can I give it to you verbally? Would you want me to write it down so you can look at it at your own time? What whatever it may be, just providing options is always the best thing to do with survivors and also survivors family it does things don't just affect the survivor there's vicarious trauma and secondary trauma which you know some mediums mm -hmm. will feel as well but also that is like loved ones of people who have been victimized that is family members of those survivors that are going through vicarious and secondary trauma as well and so we have to tread lightly, send our heart forward, and really be cognizant about our language, our energy, our tone. Even if your cell phone like makes a loud noise, like, you know, a lot of these survivors will have PTSD from their events and anything that can be triggering is, anything that could be triggering can bring up those memories. Those memories, are attached to language, to what they see, to noises, anything. And so we're just trying to create a safe space that I'm just going off right now, but we're just trying to create a safe space to minimize the amount of times we can trigger them. And that also goes for the loved ones of the survivors as well. A hundred percent. And none of this is boring. Like this is all stuff we need to know needs to be <laughs> talked about a lot more in this space. So you're just dropping wisdom here. Okay. So do not doubt yourself oh. here for a second, but I just want to say for the listeners as well, and the people here is like, much like Kay was saying, you know, in some situations where the, cause there's an advocate, I have found that in a lot of these cases, there's actually like a family advocate as well that you can work through again, to kind of like carry some of that and take some of that off of the direct family and the immediate family as well. So something you might want to add in that um, choice, is there an advocate that you have that I can work through? Very, very important. And I'm very excited. And I'll, I'll show you tomorrow how I took like kind of like a five-step process in this family because it was so sensitive. And it's like, I'm going to take this slowly and like one thing, at a time and we're going to work together and it took you know some time but it was done in a way that like I feel pretty good about so this is very very helpful now I just want to see if there's 
So somebody here says, do you feel like you use your psychic abilities in all your cases or do you pick and choose when you do? Now you talked about this a little <laughs> bit. I'm curious. You call it in or, you know, sometimes is, too, do you look back like, oh my God, I've already, I've always had this. Like, this is such a great question. I'm so, who asked this? This is Steph. Oh, Just because it's going on the Steph. podcast and I don't want to leave like yes. first and last names or anything. Oh, yeah. but... <laughs> this is such a great question because, oh my gosh. So the more and more I've developed and been on my spiritual journey, the more and more the things that I used to take credit for, like, oh, I can talk to anyone or, oh, the other cops send me all of these types of cases because I can make anyone talk. I can get suspects to talk. Da, 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 da. And But what I'm realizing, it, it really was clear cognizant. I was this channel and I was, so I can't take any of that credit. It was just spirit, like working through me to help get the information that I needed. Um, so like before I used to kind of think I was like, had street credit, a little badass, like, oh yeah, I'm like, you know, I call them French fries. So like for every five years, you'll see that there's these marks on officer sleeves. It's like, oh yeah, like I've got French fries. I've got street credit. I can talk to anyone. But really the more I developed, I realized that these were my Claire's hmm. and that they were helping me with my cases. And I couldn't necessarily take that credit as much as I wanted to take that credit, that spirit that was working through me and I wish I could remember a time, but I can't, but I can just remember my mind was blown when I was realizing in an interview that this person in a jail cell waived their Miranda rights was talking to me and somehow I was just saying things. Oh, I do remember. <laughs> I remember that this just came out of my mouth. I had never said it before. I had never thought about saying it before. And I basically said something to the effect of, you know, the, the crimes against you are pretty egregious. This is your only way to tell your side of what happened. If you don't speak with me, the judge and the jury, they're never going to hear your side of what happened. And so I can give you a pen and a piece of paper and you can explain everyone what traumas you've had as a child, what why you act the way you act so that people have a much better understanding about you and why you did what you did. And he still had not admitted yet. And he mm -hmm. wrote this whole, he admitted it was like a confession, but he also unfortunately shared a lot of traumas that happened in his childhood, which is very common in which you did ask earlier, the more open I get, the more understanding in that I can see so quickly that I thought everyone could see it's like, oh, they have abandonment issues or, oh, like they're, I could feel like their dad left them when they were younger and they have abandonment issues. Or I feel like maybe they had a lot of siblings or whatever. They really want to be seen. And it was so obvious to me, but I think those were just my Claire's. So my Claire's have definitely helped me with cases, but they've definitely helped humanize suspects as well. So it's a very tricky place to be when you see them also as survivors that just didn't heal and yeah. did not maybe have the resources to heal and they went on to hurt people. And that is a very difficult place um, for me to be when I know, you know, I'm about to put them in handcuffs. Um, and they're not going to get the, the help and resources that they need, but we are taking them out of a community so they can no longer hurt anyone. Yeah. Yeah. That's, thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you love that question. We have two more here and then we'll probably wrap her up, but I'm sure we'll have you back for part two because this was so, so interesting. And I <laughs> a gazillion things you can share with us. I really like that response to it. A comparable I have because I didn't know how clear cognizance worked and I didn't realize that was like my number one like strength, but I've always had like jobs I was like never qualified for, but I always knew how to do. I'm like, I would just get something. I'm like, I know how to do this. I don't know how I know how to do this, but I know how to do this. And um, it's kind of wild. And when I started developing as a psychic and as a medium, I was like, oh, it's like clear cognizance. It's like this knowing like, 
you know, I always just say, it's like that meme where I'm like, I could just learn by osmosis. Like that whole mapping <laughs> thing. It's like, I talked to this mentor once and this is like her system. It's like, I kind of knew how to do it. Just like, like talking to her it was kind of weird. So yeah, our abilities are, they're phenomenal. Well, this that's an amazing, amazing. clear. Amazing yeah. player to have as your strength. And then also too, you like we learn things and you know this in many past lives as well. So maybe you've just had a lot of past lives here on this earth as well, where you're like, oh, I've done this before. I've got this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need a spreadsheet. I'm like, I have hustled in corporate. No, in past lives, like really <laughs> like thriving. I'm a Capricorn South note, so I wouldn't be surprised if I did. Okay. So Cindy asks, do you ever come across people using their intuition when they are giving evidence with you? Oh, interesting. Yes. I mean, cops are very intuitive, but they call it street smarts. And so when, when you're like, maybe what I think this question is trying to ask and correct me if I'm wrong, is that like when I'm maybe speaking to a witness, they have this gut feeling in their intuition and they're providing me information. Yes, that happens a lot. But unfortunately, since I have to document facts only, I have to ask them like, oh, what makes you say that? Like, did you see something, you know, and I have to it's really unfortunately only going to be seen as a valid lead for me to take if it, it it can be documented as factual and as actual evidence. I like if someone literally told me like, I just have a feeling there's, I don't know, a piece of evidence, you know, at that address, that is not enough probable cause for me to write a warrant to go into the home. I need probable cause that a crime had occurred, is occurred, had occurred at that residence in that there's enough evidence that an officer with my same training and experience would believe with the facts provided would be found in that residence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in saying that, it kind of brings about this question that just kind of like on topic, but not, but yeah. you know, it, 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 for, from a psychic's perspective, like if, if you had to pick like three or four pieces of evidence that you think cops or law enforcement would take really seriously from us, what would that be? Like, what would be like, this is going to get my attention? I think that would be different for everyone. More people mm -hmm. are open than others, but obviously the more detailed. And so I think like providing like oh i there is a piece of jewelry that i feel like the survivor wore and it is gold in a heart shape and i have a feeling it's at this park and it'll be the location of the crime and i know it's very very specific but some people need that much information yeah. and that's as much information we would need to document like a write a supplemental report that this was a a witness statement that provided this and, and stated that she is a medium and this is the information she provided and we were able to confirm this. We were able to confirm this. We were able to confirm this and take photographs of it. Um, and the more things that you can cooperate, then possibly I could see them utilizing the medium or the psychic more for yeah. other things, but it would it would have to be a lot. <laughs> Right. And then would that make us a suspect <laughs> if we knew that um, much? <laughs> yes, I do think so. So I think obviously just having proof that you weren't there, photographs yeah. that you were at dinner with a friend, because that, that's a very good question in that would totally – totally make you a person of interest and so you would have to clear your name and in order to clear your name you just have your like what were you doing at that date and time of when the crime was like here's pictures of me at din at my friend's birthday dinner in a different city like I'm a psychic. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting a lot of kudos for my follow-up question. <laughs> Look, I'm that trying to get my question. students out of prison, okay? Like, <laughs> 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 though, I, you gave us a tip at the retreat, and I did ask a BC lawyer about it, and I was like, yo, she's right. And I'm like, dang, I'm like, case got the juice. So I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, you do. So I, I trust you. 
If you ever need to talk to a cop, just call me. <laughs> oh, I will. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So there was one more question here from Michelle where, and I'm curious about this one too. Has your intuition or spirit helped you get out of a life-threatening or dangerous situation? Yes. I think that every single time it has to be spirit. You know, I do believe that... I do believe that our soul signed up for what we're going to do in this lifetime. And I also believe that there's different exit points. Like I'm sure you had a podcast on that. And there's been times that things have been very dangerous and I've been very close to getting hurt or hurting someone. And just all of a sudden, the one that I'm thinking of was, you know, Thank goodness I have never had to discharge my firearm in the course of my duty. But there's this time that's really close. And when your finger is on the trigger, like there's a reason. And it just got silent and the person dropped the knife. And I know now that that was spirit and, and it was not their time to go. And it was not my time to have that, carry that grief. Um and all that comes with that. But I do remember like, you know, there's yelling and you're, you're putting out orders and there's everyone and their mom coming on the radio in your ear. But the moment before they dropped their knife, all I remember was silence and peace for maybe it was a millisecond. I don't know. But there's also times too, like I'm not very big. I, I'm short and I'm tiny. I have like a bigger presence. People are always like, you're not that short. And I'm like, I am. They think I'm like four or five inches taller. And I think that's just my shining personality. <laughs> and, <laughs> I think so. Um, thank you. And I think that there's been times that I could have really gotten physically hurt in just like either my we call it verbal judo or now I know it's spirit just saying the right things that would make the person stop right when they need to stop before I immediately get hurt. And so I'm very grateful for the spirit world to allow me to keep helping people without injuring myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't take any credit. I think that's all spirit. And that was such a great question. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Michelle, for asking that. And uh... Yeah, you know, there's a request here, like, can you teach a class for us on trauma-informed as it relates to cases? We'll definitely have to create something. So I would love yeah, to. It's we can important. look for that. I think so, too. I think so, too. And I think that, you know, there's been, I can't say this for sure, but there doesn't seem a lot of attention on this type of, like, delivery or this kind of, like, client care when it comes to, you know, we're even as a medium, you know, we're dealing with people who've experienced some of the biggest losses of their life. Like, there's a lot of trauma. And yes. um, holding space for that, like, you have to take care of yourself when you do that. And you will receive what you can hold space for, maybe a little bit more sometimes to, like, test your boundaries a little bit, but, and, and stretch them and continue the needle moving along. Long, but I'm glad that you brought up the things that you brought up. Yeah, 100%. definitely. Yeah. So to close us out, because we're we're almost going to hit 90 minutes here, and I want to say thank you, and you know, just you know, a lot of love in the chat. Thank you, Gabby, for keeping the vibe going in the chat too. She was also in law enforcement for seven years, so she's been in there, just you know, really pumping you up energetically. So thank you so <laughs> thank much, you, Gabby, you for your comments. <laughs> but to close us off. What's the future for Kay? Like you've been in law enforcement for 10 years. You've been developing for, you know, three years. You're celebrating three years essentially now. So what do the next 10 years look like for Kay? What's the big dream? Wow. My big dream. Obviously I've, I have my thoughts, but I learned that to surrender and trust and, and spirit will guide me. I actually just had a practice reading last night with someone from mastermind and, and it feels very aligned. And I think I will stay in this type of work. I don't necessarily know if it's going to be law enforcement. I love doing what I do. And I love if, if this is the journey that the survivors want to go on, if, if they want to hop on this criminal justice train that I feel is broken at times, but if that's where they feel their healing is, then I will do everything to help them with that. I just obviously wish that the patriarchy and the men that I work for would 
be a little bit easier to work for. Mm -hmm. And so if I could move forward with this, I would go to Sacramento, change some of the things that I feel are giving more power to suspects than survivors. Mm -hmm. I can see myself working with the same type of survivors, but helping them heal with guiding them through the criminal justice system, helping them heal way, collecting, collecting, by connecting with their loved ones. I really am enjoying nerding out on the science behind the healing vibrations of different sacred instruments for sound healing and just all the paths, acupuncture to help someone heal because they're not supposed to be broken their whole life. They're supposed to heal these wounds and then help others heal. And the faster, not the faster, I'm sorry. The quickest, gentlest way that they can do that and get them out of this darker space and when they can move their vibration up, it will help others around them. Like you talk about this pebble in the pond and the ripple effect, and they can do that as well because you know spirit gives us these life experiences so that we can connect with other people and we can help them heal as well. And so the short answer to what you asked me is I guess it would be using all the modalities and all the tools on my tool belt to help people heal. And if that is the criminal justice system, or if that is connecting with loved ones, or if that is moving energy through yoga, then that's what I want to do. It's, I'm not picky. They can be picky and I can guide them in either way. And if they're drawn to me, I will do everything I can to help them because I know that they will help others as well. No, oh, I love that, Kay. I love that. And, you know, I'm holding that vision with you and I know no matter where you go, you're going to bring healing and yeah, I'm just excited to see where all of this takes you. So thank you for spending so much time being so generous with your wisdom, your experiences, your storytelling, your energy with Spirit School. I know that so many people valued this conversation. You're getting a lot of love in the chat. And then how do you feel? Is this your first podcast interview slash live like this? Is it, it is. It is. <laughs> and it's, of course, it's you. I literally, my intention was being authentic and being seen. And here we are. And you reached out like a couple of weeks ago and I was like, I just made this intention. And so this is all divinely timed and synchronistic. And I'm just saying yes. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for allowing me to talk about something that is so part of my life and that I love so much. And I love sharing. There is no this is only going to help people and I love sharing it. So thank you so much for having me in. This is my first time. I will remember it forever. I will remember all of you forever. I see that in the chat and I just feel like I have all these cheerleaders and I'm like so excited. Yeah. I feel very supported and that's how I want to make other people feel, but it's nice to get that feeling in return as well. And so I'm very grateful for it. Well, you got so many people rooting you on and supporting you. So, you know, a legion of angels surround you all the time and a lot of love to you. A lot of big things happening for you. I'm so excited to see what comes next. So thank you, Kay. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Good Collect night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. And we'll see you guys tomorrow in Spirit School. Bye, everyone. <laughs> You're welcome.